She's a real woman with a real life. She's someone you can relate to. Dawn Newton. Welcome to the Don Newton Podcast. I am your host, Don Newton. Jeffrey Epstein. Did this billionaire pedophile hang himself in his jail cell or was he murdered? What does the lawyer who represents 20 of Epstein's victims say really happened behind the headlines to bring him down? Well, joining me today is that lawyer, Bradley J. Edwards. He is a lawyer for more than 20 of Epstein's accusers. He has spent most of his life fighting for victims of abuse. His new book, Relentless Pursuit, My Fight for the Victims of Jeffrey Epstein, tells the true crime story of how Edwards managed to do what the U.S. Justice Department couldn't, take down this ultra-rich, ultra-powerful person for his crimes. Brad Edwards, it's great to talk with you. Your book, Relentless Pursuit, My Fight for the Victims of Jeffrey Epstein, this details uh, the decade you spent on a case against a billionaire pedophile, Jeffrey Epstein. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate the time to talk with you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. And uh, and yeah, it was not only fighting Jeffrey Epstein, but also at times fighting our own government as well. I mean, it was like a big machine. Yeah. Um, you know, Jeffrey Epstein had his own machine and had his own laws and his own rules and was somehow able to, at least initially, corrupt the system enough to convince even those that we rely on to keep things even. He was able to convince them to some degree he can live by his own rules and his, his own set of laws. Uh, and it was our job to try to correct that misunderstanding that he had. And you represented close to 20, 20 of his victims, and you met one of the victims in June of 2008. Prior to that, were you familiar with Jeffrey Epstein? No, prior to June 2008, I didn't know anything about him. I think one of the things that he had done so masterfully, uh, with the help of the government, of course, was to keep um, all of his crimes localized, at least in terms of the media, and make sure that people really didn't appreciate what he had done. So even though I was only one county away, I had no idea who he was. And then as you learned about it, I bet that was pretty startling and realizing the, the depths and his power. How does somebody like a Jeffrey Epstein obtain such power and protection? I mean, he the levels and the depths of his protection and, and corruption was is pretty astounding. He is a special person in that, you know, a lot of people throw around this word sociopath, but it gets overused. He really had no conscience whatsoever, and he amassed a, a fortune, you know, financial fortune, and he used that combination of just being a manipulative person that is extraordinarily power hungry and wanted uh, to be able to prove that he was the king of his own castle and that he made his own rules. And he used his money primarily to accumulate people, whether it was other businessmen that were powerful, other world leaders, former presidents, scientists, uh, and uh, ultimately control a huge staff of people working for him and, uh, and then dozens, if not hundreds, of victims of his uh, sexual addiction to very young wi women and, and children. Uh, so, and he was constantly thinking of other ways to control more people, and anyone who got in his way he wanted to uh, make sure that, that 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 person was taken care of as well. So uh, it, it takes a real evil genius to pull off what he was able to for so long. And he didn't hide it. No, he did it out in the open. I mean, the things that he was doing on a daily basis, regardless of who was in his company, was kind of the astounding part to me. I mean, even when I first talked with Courtney Wilde and she was in my office, her request was pretty simple. It was, 
I'm cooperating in this massive federal investigation against this billionaire who um, sexually abused me and many of my friends and dozens of others. And she told me how his scheme worked. And I started looking into into it and I saw, wait, he's doing this to children three and four times a day everywhere he goes on a daily basis in the wide open. In fact, he has assistants working in his house that are making telephone calls to high school girls to make sure that they show up at his house so that he can do with them what he wants. He has chefs that are serving them cereal in the kitchen to make sure that they're happy. Uh, he, he did it in the wide open. And even, you know, you'll read in the book later on when he files a lawsuit against me in an attempt to extort me into abandoning my clients. He wanted me off of his back for obvious reasons. He tries to even impart this odd philosophy in conversations to me that, you know, the laws of our society – should not really pertain to him. And they're this overly conservative set of guidelines for regular people to live by. But he's a jet-setting billionaire who goes easily from one jurisdiction to the other and can't possibly be required to keep up with the changes of the laws, especially as it relates to consent and things like that. And that any intellectual would understand that what he's doing, allowing, in his mind, trailer park kids into his presence and into his home, isn't really all that bad and that I should really leave him alone. Apparently didn't fear the government or the FBI, but he feared you. What was the difference? He felt that his power and control and connections could get him out of any problem at any time. And he recognized in me that I wasn't going to be bought off. I wasn't going to be intimidated by his lawsuits or his personal threats. And that I had made up my mind that one way or the other, we were never going to give up until he was held accountable which made him very nervous because he played a lot of different games with me. He, he sued me and then offered basically to drop the lawsuit if I would leave him alone. That didn't work. He offered to pay me. That didn't work. He told me, Brad, if you keep prosecuting me this way, somebody's going to get hurt. And I knew that when he said that, there was only one other person in the room. So <laughs> he was talking about me. Um, uh, he put me and my family under surveillance. When none of it worked, he, he got scared because he realized this really was going to be a relentless pursuit to the very end until somebody was going to get hurt. Uh, it ultimately turned out to be him getting arrested, uh, which I think is, you know, a happy story uh, that comes out of this real sordid, sad uh, bad, um, you know, long story of abuse on his part. It really, to me, was shameful that he was able to commit suicide, take his own life and deprive the victims and me and, and the public of watching him be held accountable for all the bad things he had done. Well, and even that's under speculation. People think that, that he didn't commit suicide, that he was murdered. What are your thoughts on that? I think that had he stayed alive longer in jail, he probably would have been murdered, honestly. <laughs> but knowing him, you know, I did get to know him on a personal level because we had a lot of, uh, you know, we litigated against one another for over a decade. And at some stage when he realized he wasn't getting his way with me, he started asking to meet me personally, which is very unorthodox when people are in litigation to drop their lawyers, so to speak, and just go meet. So I got to know him through these personal meetings. And he really only cared about power and control. He had to be the most powerful person in the room and in the world. And he had to control everyone around him, from the girls coming into his home, to his staff, to even his high-powered friends. He always wanted to make them feel indebted to him and that he was the one in power. When he was arrested 
and he felt like he had a chance of getting out of jail. He still had a lot of control over the victims. They were still scared. None of them really wanted to cooperate, not many of them anyway. His staff, his employees were not cooperating. And you saw that the powerful people that he had been associated with weren't saying a whole lot. Once his bond was denied and he realized he was never getting out of jail and uh, a lot of the witnesses started cooperating against him, his world was caving in. He was all always going to be the person being controlled instead of in control. Yeah, he tried to take his own life. We knew when he attempted suicide that he would never fail at that attempt again. And we were told that he was on suicide watch and so we, we wouldn't have anything to worry about um, because the only thing then that he could control was his destiny going forward. And so it really didn't come as a surprise to me when I found out that he committed suicide. He just was not going to be uh, a rat in somebody else's cage. He only liked to be on the other end of that equation. What was the, what was the catalyst? What was the final episode event that caused him to be arrested? I mean, this has been going on for 10 years going after him. And it seemed like it was such a kind of a slam dunk, no brainer at the very beginning in 2008 we had all these witnesses and but it took 10 years what was the what was the catalyst there well the case in 2008 was extraordinarily strong in fact i can't think of another case in american history that's ever been more of a slam dunk and that was butchered and i say intentionally butchered and then it was 10 years of my investigation for the most part through civil litigation and uncovering all of his crimes in other jurisdictions that got a lot of attention at the end of 2018 when he settled his case with me and publicly apologized for uh, filing a false lawsuit against me and trying to attack me. And he says in his, um, in his apology to me that it was my relentless pursuit of him that held him responsible. Well, that event was very public at the time. The media was uh, on the Me Too movement, was finally paying attention, and New York prosecutors were also paying attention. And I um, shared with them the fruits of my investigation that, had, uh, that we had accumulated over the last 10 years. And they realized what everybody knew by that point, or at least everybody who was paying attention knew, is that Jeffrey Epstein's crimes permeated throughout every location where he had homes, especially New York. And New York began then at the beginning of, at the end of 2018 and for the next seven months, preparing a very strong local case against Jeffrey Epstein for the sex trafficking crimes that he committed in their jurisdiction. So, you know, it was the culmination of all of our efforts and of a bunch of brave victims who were working behind the scenes in fear but it, with this never give up attitude to make sure that he was finally brought to justice. I mean, the, the way that we were able to do that without Jeffrey Epstein catching wind of it and shutting it down, it, it really is to the credit of the prosecutors in New York, as well as the many victims that were um, putting kind of their lives on the line, so to speak. When I was reading too, that President Trump gave you some intel that assisted is that correct? Yeah, but this is back in 2009, obviously way before, well before he was president. Uh, he's one of uh, the people that I knew was, had at one time been an, uh, a close associate or friend or business partner of Jeffrey Epstein. And so I served him with a subpoena for a deposition. And I served many people in that caliber with deposition subpoenas. And he's the only one who had his lawyer immediately call me set up a telephone call with him, and I think I spoke the first time for 30 or 45 minutes with him, and over the years, he kept basically an open-door policy where I could check in with him and check certain facts and ask him uh, whether I had the right, I was on the right track or I had the right lead, and because he knew the world in which Jeffrey Epstein traveled, and at one point in time was a social acquaintance of uh, Jeffrey Epstein's, and no longer liked Jeffrey Epstein. I had a lot of things going for me. Uh, he, 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 did, uh, he did provide a very helpful information. And it also helped that he, wasn't, he was one of the few who just wasn't scared of Jeffrey Epstein. Because that's what I ran into a lot. It's just people refusing to talk because, out of 
pure fear. And there was over excess of 50 victims. How are these women today? Uh, they range the, the uh, spectrum. Uh, in fact, you know, I think that it was originally reported that I represented over 20 victims. At this point, I personally represented over 40 victims. I know of there being at least 100 victims, and that is very conservative. And some have unfortunately uh, taken their own lives because of the damage that was done. Some of them spent 10, 12 years in a very bad place in their life, whether it was self-medicating or getting into other uh, relationships of uh, victimization. And others, uh, others went to prison. I mean, uh, when you just watch the, what happened to these girls when they were teenagers and as they developed trying to cope with the way he stole their innocence and the damage that he did to them, it's really unbelievable kind of the, 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 the harm that he was able to, uh, that he was able to do on, on such a massive scale. Uh, but many of them have come out of this, and while they bear the scars, they, uh, they're strong people. They're people who, I, who are now close friends of mine. I mean, as you read the book, you know, you can tell with Courtney Wilde and Virginia Roberts and Maria Farmer and some of these people I'm so close to, and I know their personal life, and they've really kind of uh, turned things around and have turned this real negative thing into a positive and are using their voices to help not only other victims of Jeffrey Epstein, but other victims in similar situations. I'm really proud of them. So, I mean, for some of them, it really has made them a better person overall, but it's really unfortunate what they had to endure to get there. And what toll did this take on you, Brad, and your family? I can't imagine you're the same attorney you were 2008 yeah, no, you are I today. No, I'm, I'm 44 years old, and I feel like I'm 64 sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of those things where I chose this career path where I'm going to represent the underdog and represent crime victims against powerful people, and, uh, and I'm a fighter by nature, so it's, it's you, you know what you're getting into, but... When every single time you think that you got the upper hand and somebody is able to manipulate the system or tell lies about you or, or scare your clients and it's one more obstacle after another, there's nobody that, that wouldn't be worn down. Uh, but, you know, last year when he got arrested and we saw kind of the, the fruits of our efforts, then, you know, you're, you're, you're revitalized and you realize – that there is justice, you know, it's just a matter of fighting through all of the, all of the evil to get there. Um, but, you know, this is just one of a very important case in our office, but it has certainly helped make it to where our office dedicates 100% of our time to representing victims of crime, whether they were unfortunately shot or stabbed or sexually assaulted against the most powerful people or corporations or entities that, that, that help bad guys. So, you know, we fight for the good guys against bad guys. And while it's taken a toll, I would say it's been a learning lesson and it's all worth it. It's baptism by fire for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the book is Relentless Pursuit, My Fight for the Victims of Jeffrey Epstein. Bradley Edwards, it's, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Where can we learn more about you and where can we find this book? Well, I think that uh, given the current status of things, while, uh, while the book is in every bookstore, I'm told, uh, around the country, uh, I think Amazon.com is probably the best way to order it uh, while we're all kind of subjected to our house. Um, and on uh, my website is probably the best place to learn more about me, which is www.epllc.com. Well, again, Brad, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for listening to the Don Newton Podcast. I also want to thank my special guest, Brad Edwards, the lawyer for more than 20 of Jeffrey Epstein's accusers, joining us today to talk about his book, Relentless Pursuit, My Fight for the Victims of Jeffrey Epstein. To learn more about Bradley Edwards, you can visit his website, which is epllc.com, and be sure to visit my website, donnewton.org. 
The Don Newton Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Don Newton. Don't